Made to wave the flag Ooh, the red, white, and blue And when the band plays hail to the chief Ooh, they'll point the cannon at you, Lord It ain't me It ain't me I ain't no senator's son, no It ain't me It ain't me I ain't no fortunate one, no. Some folks are born silver spoon in hand. Lord, don't they help themselves? But when the tax man comes to the door, Lord, the house looks like a rummage sale. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no millionaire son, no. It ain't me, it ain't me. I ain't no fortunate one, no. Some folks inherit star-spangled eyes. Oh, and they'll send you down to war. And when you ask them how much should we give, Well, they'll only answer more, more. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no fortunate one, no. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no fortunate son, no. That was the lovely dulcet tones of Claire Fowler. This is the slightly less dulcet tones of Paul Larkin, and you're listening to the fourth in the series of Behind the Asterisk Years. Um, <clears throat> we had a couple of weeks break, primarily due to the referendum, which we'll not get any without killing ourselves, and then I was a wee bit under the weather. But thankfully we're back. Back for your entertainment pleasure, and the countdown is really on to, to the Premier in Glasgow, but let's also not forget, because we're, we're worldwide, uh, as you well know, we're also having a premiere in America. And that's why, for that and many other reasons, <clears throat> on the line I've got my good friend, your friend and mine, Mr Scott Richards, a.k.a. Yompe. How are you doing, my friend? Hi, Paul. What's going on, man? Fantastic to hear your voice. I know the listeners will be delighted. One of the, the most requested interviews of this uh, whole series has been your good self. So, Scott... Let's get straight into it. Um, <clears throat> you and I are both sort of similar age, similar generation, similar backgrounds, albeit 3,000 miles apart. What did you think about the, the asterisk years when you first heard about it? I was really excited to uh, find out there was going to be a, a project that you were doing that was going to take on the Edinburgh establishment. Mm-hmm. I felt like a lot of this you know, whole Rangers kind of stuff was pushed under the carpet a little bit by the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was really excited to see what you're going to write about. And needless to say, I I was surely totally blown away. I I was, I thought the Asterix Skiers was, was a great read. I'm excited to see the uh, documentary. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it's nice to see people like uh, Mr. David Murray kind of like, get knocked off his golden horse a little bit. I, I think that he was a cheat. I know he's a cheat. And the stuff that you wrote about in the book just confirmed that the, the scam that their their attempt at 10 in a row was. Mm-hmm. It was a fraud. And it's kind of been, it's just a metaphor for how much of a fraud the club's been since it was created. Yeah, I mean, it's a, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on there. Um, now, first of all, as I, as I mentioned in the intro, you're similar kind of background to myself, you know, uh, sort of working class or blue collar, as we call in America. Um, what do you? What's your whole take on the whole little guy against the big guy thing? I mean, I know. I mean, I obviously lived in America, and I know how hard it is for a little guy to to get on uh, in, in life. You know, and, and the American dreams, <laughs> pretty much a nightmare for most. Let's say that, but. What what is it about taking on the big guy that you love as a, someone who's kind of had to work uh, hard all their life? I, I I get a rush from being able to stand up for the little guy. I don't like to see people get picked on. Mm. 
I, um, you know, people joke about me being a physically big dude and everything. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I was younger, I was kind of very passive to seeing things like, you know, kids get bullied and this and that. But as I got older, it, it I, I kind of, the, the other side of me came out a little bit. It was just like, you know, there there are people in this world that you can stand up for mm. that, that get oppressed and get kicked down and, and stepped on and, and don't have advantage like a David Murray had advantage. Yeah. And you have to stand up for these people. Yeah. And for me, it, that's that's my reason to live, what they call that, the raison de tre, whatever the hell mm. it is. It, it's my reason to live. You stand up and fight for the little guy. You, you always, you, you want to always be somebody to, that you can sit there at the end of your days when you meet your maker to be able to sit there and say you know what what did you do with your life mm. if you were if you weren't a rich guy and you couldn't cure cancer and you couldn't do all this stuff what the fuck did you do and what i want to be able to say is is that i had passion for people that didn't have a voice i had passion for people that need standing up for make a difference in someone else's life Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not a perfect individual. I don't have fifty thousand degrees, and I'm not certified at everything. But I. I still have a voice. I still have passion to see justice in this world. Yeah. And, and that's that's what gets me charged up and blows my hair back every day. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you say that because I think, um, and I think I've said this before, um, that the, one of the lessons I've learned throughout this project is that. There are a certain um, type of person who basically say to me and people like me, you're not supposed to have an opinion. You know, you're not supposed to voice anything at all. That's us that do it. The elite are the ones that do the thinking. It it's that, almost me- that, that lie down, crappy kind of, crappy lie down kind of mm. like mentality that you shouldn't, but because you're a working class guy, yeah. that, that what you think and what you believe and feel strongly about doesn't count. That's mm. horseshit. Your your opinion matters just as much as the richest man in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, and, and so why not? Why not use your voice for good, man? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's one of these things where um, there seems to be this sort of idea that that kind of perpetrates amongst these people that if you are that if you are rich, therefore you are the most clever, the most talented, the most bright guy in the room, which is utter rubbish. You know what I mean? Um, certainly some people through their, their talent and their brains will get to the top but other people it's just because of the opportunity and one of the ways that the Edinburgh establishment was able to go on for years was to, by denying the opportunity to people like me or people like you in, a, in, a, in, a, in an American sense was that you didn't even know these opportunities exist hey, it's not, it's not even so much that we don't know it exists because this is like a self-perpetuating cycle the David Camerons of the world the David Murrays of the mm. world they succeed because the, the people before them have, have been, they put this process in motion that have enabled these, these so-called elite to continue going to the finest schools, to have the finest foods, mm. and, and have all the opportunity in the world set aside for them. And they keep doing this for future generations and keep this whole thing going. You, you're, you're, the common man is like a, a, a chihuahua trying to bite at the wheels of a moving car. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so how do you, how do, how are we supposed to be able to uplift ourselves and compete against that? Well, you get enough people to raise their voices and say, you know what? We're not afraid to speak out. This isn't right. We we deserve an equal opportunity too. Yeah, and it's, it's funny because I think one of the sort of differences in this sense was that um, in the kind of British class system, you don't need to have a lot of money to be at the top of the tree, whereas I think in America, you really do have to have a lot of money to be at the top of the tree. And it's different dynasties of families in America. And it's actually one of the things about David Murray, of course, and one of the things in the book and being a documentary was, of course, how it was never meant to end, how it was the baton was going to pass to the sun and, and, and just keep moving along. And that actually reminded me throughout it was the fact that it was very much like George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. Where right. Jr. could just keep failing, but eventually Daddy would find him some way that he could actually do something and look what happens, he ends up being president. And, it, and it, a, lot of the, a lot of my problem with this is that it crosses political parties. There's this mm. whole kind of like elitist mentality. It's all about them 
leading the system and leaving nothing for anybody else. They just take as much as they fucking want, and mm. it's like you have to sit there and try to survive on scraps. Yeah. How is that fair? To, how is that fair to, to working class families? Yeah. It, it's a bogus system, man. It's rigged. You're right, and it's, it's based on this kind of neoliberalism that's trickle down economics that says the rich guy give him all the money and the money will trickle down which is complete and utter bollocks you know what I mean right. if you want to build an economy you build it for the bottom you employ people you employ the working people to build infrastructures to build houses and to build roads and schools and the first thing that working man does when he gets his money he goes out and fucking spends it and that's how you build an economy anyway this is getting a bit like a party political broadcast here for Sorry, the for the Marxist it. part <laughs> um, a little bit one of the things, now, I, I like to talk to people, uh, not disparagingly, of course, behind the, behind the backs of certain people when I'm going to interview them and talk to them because I want people to see what we say. And one of the, the mm-hmm. overriding things, Scott, was people wanted me to ask you was the fact that we wanted to know what your story was in terms of how did you first encounter Celtic? <laughs> it seems to be a popular question. Um, and you know what, Paul? I, I heard about Celtic probably about... I heard about something I'd say about 15 years ago, mm-hmm. but you got to realize looking at it from being an American, we didn't have an outlet for Celtic for Scottish football. Yeah. If we had anything, it was always, you know, English football. That's all you got. Mm. And, um, as things started to open up, you know, Celtic had success, you know, in Seville and that helped a little bit. And then yeah. Celtic TV started to come around a little bit after that. But in Satanth, they would carry Celtic matches as well. Mm-hmm. So I'd say I, I first knew about Celtic about 15 years ago. I got into when Celtic TV first came, became available. I became a subscriber. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like to tell the story is that uh, the first time, I, you know, it's like the same thing when, when Graham used to have his show and everything. For the longest time, I was afraid to kind of like reach out a little bit and, and yeah. you know, get in contact because I just, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I'm fanatical about something. I, I think people think I'm a little bit weird about, you know, like <laughs> how crazy I get about something like Celtic or mm-hmm. any of the, you know, like the Philly teams and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, so w- there was a match. It was the uh, the Nakamura match where against Rangers. Yep. And uh, it was the game where Cuellar handballed right at the goal yeah, line. Yeah. And uh, I, I sent an email into Celtic TV, and uh, Jim Craig was one of the guys mm-hmm. at Celtic TV at the time. And they kind of joked a little bit about how pissed I was about it. I was like, you know, I said it should have been an automatic goal. He should, you know, Quero was rightly thrown out of the game. This is bullshit, da 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 da. And afterwards, I got an email. It was like a day later, and it's from Jim Craig, and he asked me about how I became a Celtic fan. And, mm-hmm. uh, I was so blown away. I didn't even like respond for days. I was like, "This is like, yeah, this this is like, this is one of the lions, man. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the lions, dude. I supported sports teams forever in my life, and nobody ever like, you know, <laughs> try to get a professional athlete to even throw you a shoe or something, yeah, and it's yeah. like, you know." It would be like the greatest thing ever happened. It never happens. And here's this guy who's just shooting me an email, just wanting to know about me. Mm. So. If I wasn't already over at the over the top about Celtic at that point, then I was like, you know, in from the feet up, man. I was just yeah. totally blown away, and I, and I've loved Celtic, and I love everything they stand for. I, uh, no matter how much I often bitch about things about the club, I, uh, it, it's it's been something that you know is special to me. And a couple years ago, I got my dad into Celtic as mm. well, and. And sort of became a father-son thing in reverse, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I laugh because, you know, I look at it, it's almost a year to the day that my father passed yeah. away. And uh, the priest that came to give my dad his last rites was a guy named uh, Father Mark. Mm-hmm. And Father Mark saw the Celtic scarf that I brought my dad when he was in the hospital in the, in the, the room where people are going to die are. Mm-hmm. And I saw Father Mark looking at it, and he's like, what's that about? And it was one of the um, the Tim Land scarves with the right. CFC and the crosses on it and everything. Mm-hmm. And I said, let me tell you, and it was just like this whole big thing. Like, let me tell you about Brother Walford. <laughs> and he was totally, this is 
Father Mark was totally blown away. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is what is special. This is the magic about Celtic. And, you know, I, I think everybody...